I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now for the reading of God's Word. If you would turn with me, please, to Numbers chapter 11, the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 11. And I want to begin reading in Numbers chapter 11 at verse 4. Numbers 11, verse 4. And the Scripture says in Numbers 11, verse 4, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was the color of bedellum. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meals or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And then the Lord, then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families and every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all these people upon me? Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them that thou should sayest, say unto me, Carry them in your bosom as a nursing father, beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto thy father? And whence should I have flesh to give these people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people, officials, officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take the spirit which is upon thee and put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone. Would you join me in prayer tonight? Father, God, we just ask you one more time for your divine anointing. We pray that in this service tonight, you would speak to us. We are in need of a touch. Lord, tonight, when we leave this place, may we leave here with the anointing of the Lord in our souls, ready to do a work for you, ready to tear down the kingdom of Satan. We believe that you're going to touch the church of God with fresh fire, with fresh anointing. Let the Holy Ghost be mighty upon us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I again tell you that I believe it is the will of the Lord that we have revival in the church. That's our cry. God give us a revival of your spirit. Move upon us and touch us fresh again with the Holy Ghost. In the first night of this camp meeting, I felt impressed to preach to you about certain laws or certain factors that are always evident when God gives revival, something that we could see in the seven churches of Asia. Last night, I felt impressed to the Holy Spirit to bring to you that attention, your attention about the little woman who said, I went out full but the Lord has brought me home again empty and I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted to speak to us last night and tell us to rid ourselves of our hurts and all these things that have become bondage to us and free ourselves so that we could be filled with the Spirit to the running over and that we could be so full of God that we would not be afraid of the enemy regardless of how he comes against us there's something about being drunk on the Holy Ghost, oblivious to what's taking place around you. Just that confidence of knowing, as we heard this morning, everything is going to be all right. 
But I want you to understand tonight that if you are to have revival, you must get ready that the devil is going to put up opposition against you. You might as well get ready for a fight if you're going to do something for God. You've got to really line the issues out. You've got to know where you are. You've got to understand where the problem is. You've got to know what the effects of this problem is all about. What happens when the problem arises. And you've got to know what the solution to the problem really is. I believe if you were to search all the pages of the leadership magazines and all the books on leadership, you'd never find a greater feat that took place than if you were to go back to the land of Goshen. And you could see a stammering man by the name of Moses who God told him, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he said, Lord, I can't go. But he went but because the Holy Spirit was upon him. He sent Aaron to go with him. And he stood and spoke to the greatest potentate of that day. And he said, I want to take your workforce. And I want to take them back to the land of Canaan. I want to take them back to the promised land. And you know the opposition. But in every situation, Moses was there. And the hand of the Lord rested upon him. Till finally he told them, this is the night. You put the blood on the post of the doors and tonight something is going to happen. Something is going to take place. And sure enough, when the death angel passed through, those who were covered with the blood, they were standing and they were eating the Paschal lamb. And they were ready for the command and the, and the sounding of the, of the instrument, leave out of the land of Egypt. And I see them as they start leaving out of the land. Some commentaries say that there were as many as three and a half million people. Can you imagine such a group of people? When they started leaving, people just started wanting to get in the crowd with them and get out because they knew the Lord was with them. And folks saw them going, and they brought them gold and silver and said, Here, take this. The Lord is, is with you. The Lord is on your side. And they came to that obstacle, you know. They came to the, to, the, to the Red Sea. And when it came to that place, Moses said, Now what am I supposed to do, Lord? He said, Stretch forth the rod. What you got in your hand? When he stretched forth the rod, I see three and a half million people walk across the Red Sea on dry ground. When they get over to the other side, Miriam jerks out the tambourine and they start singing, The Lord has delivered us. The Lord has provided a way. Let's sing Jehovah Jireh for a while. The Lord hath provided. And I can see them as they shout on the other side of the Red Sea as Pharaoh's army meets that terrible fate. And they're all drowned. And you can understand here as you read the Word of God, everything is going perfect. Everything is just right. They head down the Sinai Peninsula. In 40 days, in 40 days, Moses, he had Israel out of Egypt and they were camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. But that's not the problem, you see. The problem is it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And that's where we are today. If we're going to have revival, we've got to get Egypt out of Israel. The world is too much with us. The world is calling our shots in the church anymore. The world is wanting to call, to, to give us our marching orders. And we can't listen to the world because we're in a supernatural battle. And our, our power and our source is not in this world, but it's from God Almighty. And we must never forget that. I see them as they walk through the Sinai Peninsula. And the daytime, there's a pill of cloud over their head. It keeps them cool during the daytime. At nighttime, there's a pill of fire, and it keeps them warm. And they said, what are we going to eat, Moses? And Moses prayed to God every morning. He said, I'm going to lay a blanket of dew down, and, and then you're going to have some angel food laying on the ground. And all you got to do, you can forget about your recipes. We've got something prepared for you. I baked it in my oven, and I'll have it laying on the, on the table for you as soon as you get up. Can you imagine waking up every morning? and looking outside and seeing that God has provided. Well, if we just open our eyes now, we'd find God takes care of us just like that. I'm going to tell you something. If the devil could have killed some of you people, you'd have been dead a long time ago. So you need to look him in the eye and say, you rascal, you, you didn't call me and you didn't send me. I don't belong to you and you didn't give it to me and you can't take it away. The Lord daily loadeth my soul with his benefits. Amen. 
Well, they went on through the land, and finally you come to chapter 11. In chapter 11, the devil is upset about a revival. He knows something is happening. They're shouting on the way. Canaan's land is in sight, just up the peninsula a little ways, and they're going to be back in the land that flows with milk and honey. But suddenly, you see, the devil begin to do his work. And there was complaining, and God heard it, and God sent fire. And he started consuming the people. And the Bible says, Moses prayed, God, don't kill them. Oh, God, have mercy on them, and God spared the people. But then I want you to notice something else. Here is the, here is the turning point. Here is the critical point. Here is the point where revival will either go forward or it will stop. When you meet the opposition that's going to arise because of revival. The devil does not want revival. I got news for you. There's some people in your church that doesn't want revival. There's some people in your community that don't want revival. I wouldn't be surprised if there's not some preachers that don't want revival. Oh, you hear them talk sometime. You wouldn't think they want revival. Well, here's what the Word says. The Bible says they came to this place and he says, the mixed multitude fell a lusting. And when they fell lusting, then they began to influence the children of Israel. Now, we need to stop right here and identify where the problem is. The problem arises with this group of people that are called the mixed multitude. One commentary says these are men and women whose fathers were Egyptians and their mothers were Israelites. And then some say that these were people that were living in the land of Egypt. And when the, when the Israelites left out, they left out with them. Then still others say that these are people that, that were just uh, simply along for the ride. And they were Egyptians and decided to go along because everything looked like it was going their way. You know, when things really start going your way and big momentum is moving in your church, it's amazing what you can pick up. Have you ever noticed that? Some folks say, well, I don't know where they come from. It just words out all over town. We're having a big revival over here. And here they come. It's amazing how they come in. They're there. Well, he said the mixed multitude fell a lusting. I've done a little study about this mixed multitude. And, and one place I noticed in notes on number, it says, the rabble which was among you fell a lusting. And then I found another commentary that said, the riffraff which was among you fell a lusting. Suddenly, I began to realize who I was talking about. Riffraff and rabble-rousers. I don't care where you come from. There are some riffraff and rabble-rousers that don't want you to have a revival. I got to thinking, well, who are these people? I honestly believe there are plants of the devil that are placed in every church. They're just sitting there. They look like everybody else. They look like wheat, but they're tares. They're sitting there. Every time you think things about to take off, then they show their true colors. Riffraff and rabble-rousers are what I'm talking about tonight. Riffraff and rabble-rousers can hold your church back. I kind of talked about preachers last night, but I want to identify some obstacles in the church tonight and talk to you about riffraff and rabble-rousers. Well, you notice particularly here when riffraff always shows up. He, they show up when you're so far out in the desert, you can't get back on your own. Now, if they hadn't had any manna, they'd have starved to death before they could get back, wouldn't they? They had to have God to give water or they couldn't get back. So they always show up at the most inopportune moment. They'll go to church. They'll pay what seems to be tithes. They never really pay tithes. And they never join the church because, you know, they don't want to really be a member of the church. They just like to be with you. They like you singing, but, you know, that church joining stuff, that's carnal. That's man stuff. They don't really want to be part of you. They just want to be around you. You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm talking about tonight? They are hindrances to revival. They are people that are they're plants of the devil to be there to hold back the work of the Lord. Well, they'll be there with you and they'll do everything that you need done until you need $32 and a nickel to pay the light bill. And that's the week they quit giving tithes and they sit down on it. You know what I'm saying? They're going to help you until you really need them. And then they're going to say, brother, I've been led over here because I haven't been getting fed over here. <laughs> I've heard led and fed. I can't hardly stand it. How about you? Somebody asked me the other day, said, 
What's, what's God speaking to you? I said 66 books, and when I digest that, I want to know something else, you know. I haven't gone to the depths of this book yet. I tell you today, if some folks had just settle down and become disciples, God could change their life, and, and something could happen in their life. And instead of thinking they got all the answers, something else about it, you see. Riff raff and rabble rousers. Now, don't you use this sermon to jump on anybody with. You be careful with it. I had to be careful with it tonight praying about it. Riff raff and rabble rousers, they have influence on people. You ever notice that? Oh, yes, they have influence. Just like one old rotten apple in the barrel, get the whole barrel rotten, one rotten potato, mess everything else up. Something to always stir it up. Have you ever noticed that? Usually they give the first mean speech at a minister's meeting, you know so they can get on the council. And then they come up, and they're always against this motion and against that. Not down in the heart. They're just there to slow things down. Well, preach it, Brother McGuire. Get the motor running, Brother Pemberton. I may need to get out the side door tonight. Oh, yes. Yes. They're not really in it to see the work of the Lord go forward. They got the brakes on, and, and they're holding back. And, oh, they look religious, and they smell religious, and they act religious. But when the chips are down, riffraff and rabble-rousers will stand up in opposition to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're out there. They're there in your church. They may, you may think you got them with you, but they're going to raise up. When you get in that building program, and that contractor comes in and adds a little bit of extra money to you, you'll find out who they are. <laughs> when, when, the, when the man comes down from the city and he, and, he, and he brings in and closes the program and says, you haven't met this, uh, you haven't met this requirement and, and he's, that requirement, then they'll stand up and say, I told you all the time, we should have got a professional to build this building. Ever heard them talk like that? You didn't hear about it till you got in trouble. If you'd have come through, you know, everything been all right. Riff, raft, and rabble rousers. You can't tell where they are till they smell blood. And when they smell blood, brother, they're coming after you. You better know who they are, and you better look out. You pick them up down in Egypt. That's where they are. They've come along with you. They never felt the sting of the whip. They've got something to go back to. They can go back because they aren't Israelites. But you don't have anything to go back to. You sold out everything you had. You throwed it on the Lord's side. You can't go back. You've got too much to gain to lose. That's why you are here tonight. I don't want one of these pinhead theologians coming by me telling me about faith when I sold everything I had, took my two youngins and my wife and stretched them across this country and them set somewhere in some big store downtown and hoop de doo law talk to me about faith. They're riff raft and rabble rouse as far as I'm concerned. Put their bills up for sale and come on and follow me. Let's do the work of Jesus Christ. Are you praying for me? You better. I want to be, I want the Lord's spirit to be on me tonight. Please. Lord, touch us tonight. But they have an effect on good people. That's right. Good people. You see, they never thought of it until Riff Raff and Rabble Rousers thought about it. And then here's what they said. They said, who is going to feed us? They've been eating every morning. <laughs> they had manna laying out there every day. But suddenly Riff Raff and Rabble Rousers said, I'm so sick of this manna. I've had manna in the morning, manna in the evening, manna at supper time. I'm sick of manna. Oh, have you ever heard that? Well, it seemed like it's the same old seven and six down here. Well, maybe if you get in and seek God, God change it. Amen? I'm talking about revival now. Well, I see riff raps and rabble rousers. They have an effect on the good people. They never thought about it to then. It's amazing. You never thought about what a man said to somebody brings it out. Have you ever Heard that said? Did you hear what he said tonight? I wonder what he meant by that. You riff raff and rabble rouser. What are you trying to stir up? Opposition to the preacher? Huh? Oh, yes, you are. Might as well admit it. There's a hidden motive way down inside of you. You're still back in Egypt. You can go back there. You can go back there because you didn't have to leave it all. Hallelujah. But we've been making bricks. And our backs have been beaten. And we were tired of it. And we're going to the promised land. Get out of the way. We're going across in the name of Jesus. Well, look what happened to the people. The people heard him. And here's what the Bible tells us. When they heard him, heard them, this is what they said. They said, who's going to feed us? And then they started crying and thinking about the good old days. Oh, 
I'm so sick of this manna. We have manna over here that's it looks like bedellum, and we beat on it, and we messed it up, and we poured it out, and we baked it. We've had manna every way you can have it. You know what I'm saying? We've had it till we're sick of it. We just can't take any more. I wished I had some garlic, and I had some of those onions from down in Egypt, and I really wished I had a melon. Now, if I was God, I'd say, you want a melon, brother? You're getting ready to get one. I'd send them a 500-ton melon traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Look up, here comes your watermelon. You've never seen a watermelon like you're going to get, but thank God I'm not God, amen? You've been there, haven't you, preacher? You want it, brother, here it comes. Glory to God. I saw a pastor one time, he come in my office, and he said, I'd like to make God for 30 seconds. I'd wipe that crowd out. <laughs> Thank God he wasn't God, amen? And he didn't mean it. Maybe. <laughs> but they have an effect upon the people. Can you imagine this? Here are grown men hanging on a tent pole crying, I want a watermelon. I want an onion. Oh, God, could you send some garlic down here? I'm so hungry for garlic. I'm so hungry for an onion. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I wish we had what they have uptown. I wish our music program could be better than what it is. I didn't notice it till Brother So-and-so mentioned it, but really the choir's off key. And you know the sound is too loud. And you know you can't ever adjust the heat in this building. There's something wrong. Hang on your tent pole and cry, brother. Yeah, just cry all you want to. It really helps things out just to moan and groan and cry about it. And I tell you, there's some people here tonight. You probably come here. If you get a half chance, you'll tell me off. If you get a half chance, you'll tell the overseer off. If you get a chance, you'll tell your preacher off before you leave. You're just sitting on it, aren't you? Somebody stirred you up. Somebody stirred your nest up, brother. I would imagine, I would imagine old brother Riff Raff been by your house today. And sister Rabble Rouser's probably parked over in your driveway today. Well, they're going to hold back revival. That's what's going to happen. Oh, I can identify with this. See, I, I believe I can identify with pastor. I figured I'd be pastoring all my life. I, I pastored three churches, and I had the record of longevity in two of them, and the other one, I don't know what happened there. But uh, anyway, I, I think I can understand preachers. And, and I, I've had the most glorious opportunity of pastoring the greatest people in all the world. Never had to leave a church that I couldn't leave crying and wanting to stay. I just, it just does something to me. I love people. My dad's a preacher. My granddad was a preacher. My father-in-law's a preacher. My mother was a preacher. Yeah, my mother's a preacher. Some of you can lag your tongue about that. She sure preach. I saw God use her three or four times. Yeah. I know you say, God, don't call women. Well, you better watch out, buddy. He'll shut your mouth up. I've seen it do it before. Amen. One fellow walked in my office one time. I was over here. He said, I don't know about these women preachers. I said, what about them? He said, I don't know if that's a God. I said, well, my mother was one. He, oh, brother, I'm sorry. You know, I, I guess they can do something. <laughs> Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. My brother-in-law's a preacher. My brother's a preacher. My sister married a preacher. What about that? I believe I know something about preachers, and I know what happens when riff wrapped and rabble. And I got to reading about old Moses and what he says here in verse uh, uh, 7. He says, oh, Lord, what? Have I done wrong? <laughs> Isn't that the first thing? What have I done to deserve this? What have I done? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Dear Lord, I've prayed it. Now, God, now, Lord, uh, what have I done to deserve this? Did I, did I, is this what I, <laughs> is this the bargain I made with you? And the first thing he's saying, God, what have I done wrong? We, we sometimes assume the blame on ourselves and we think, hey, I've done something. No, 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 no. You are in a battle. You're in a war. And that's your enemy. He's coming against you. And the first thing he wants to do is undermine your confidence and faith in God. You just say, Lord, if I've done anything wrong, I put it under the blood right now. Any apology need to be made, I, I'll go apologize. Whatever it takes. But I'm not going to carry the responsibility for riff wrapped and rabble rousers. I'm going to stand up with tears in my eyes and tell them there's a way out of this circumstance. And I'm not going to carry the responsibility for it. Boy, I like what he says here in, in verse 12. He said, have I conceived these people? Are these the people that, I, that I, am I their daddy, in other words? Now, understand this. 
that means you can't leave them at the general assembly or you can't leave them at the camp meeting. You know what I'm saying? Because if, if they're your children, oh, I, I could be a, a state overseer or a, an official for a few days or, or months, but I'll always be Mark and Michelle's daddy. I mean, no matter what happens, I'll always be their daddy. You can't, and when you're their daddy, that's it. That's it from then on. And Moses said, dear Lord, can I ever get out of this mess I'm in? Am I, am I their daddy? Am I stuck with this crowd from now on? I prayed that prayer too, haven't you? God, how in the world am I going to get out of this mess? You know, this old cantanker so-and-so over here, you're going to have to help me or I'm going to be in a bad situation. He questioned his calling. God, what's going on? And then he said again, he says, and this is when I sort of interpret myself. He said, God, where am I going to find flesh out here in the wilderness? In my words, here's what he's saying. They don't need a pastor here. They need a miracle worker. How about that? Have you ever been there? I remember one day I had a big fish supper. I had to make a mortgage payment that month. I don't believe I've ever seen snowflakes so big in all of my life. I know the devil magnified them. I was at Cherry Hill, right at the very end where the uh, uh, sunset fellow said sunsets twice between him and town. He said he lives so far out in the country, he had to go toward town just to go hunting. Now that's living out there, isn't it? <laughs> They had to drive 15 miles just to get to my fish supper. But them big old snowflakes started falling and I wasn't getting anything harder to live off of. I was just making a payment and the overseer said, I want you to go up there because I think you're young enough to sell fried chicken and fish and keep that program going to keep that building paid for. And I, I believed him. Thank God for some way to get on the wagon. Thank God. He knew I was a fish frying chicken cooking preacher, I reckon. And that's how I got my first church. But those snowflakes got so big, I thought, oh, God, what's going to happen today? I'll be eating chicken and fish the rest of my life. And all of a sudden, man, the Lord just seemed to say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whose name is on that church? And I thought, oh, my, my. you think I was glad I wasn't Methodist or Baptist that day. I said, church of God? <laughs> Boy, sometimes it's good to blame him with something. It's your church, Lord. That's whose it is. That's who it belongs to. And so are the Methodists and so are the Baptists and everybody else. But I want you to know, my friend, you come to a place sometimes you think they don't need a preacher. They need a miracle. That's what we say. You say, brother, I don't, I've had so much potential it's about to kill me. But you know they need potential too, don't they? And that's what happens. But finally, finally Moses says, now God, God, if you really love me, here's what I want you to do. You see what I've got to put up with. God, if you really love me, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Kill me. There's some things worse than living and dying. Something worse than dying. You say, what is it? When you've got a church in reverse, when the devil's tearing up the church, and you got a passion for ministry, and you sit there and see his devious hand at work, you can't sleep, you can't eat well, you walk the street sometime like a zombie. I prayed that prayer, God, hey, look, just take me on out of the way if it's me. It comes to that place. That's why we see preachers broken today. We see preachers that are being destroyed by the devil because the devil's coming to them and saying there's no hope, there's no way out, there's no opportunity for you. But I want to tell you today, he's a liar from the pit of hell. Yes, he is. You can have revival. Amen. Well, oh, oh, Moses said, God, now get down to brass tacks. God, if, if you love me, if you really love me, everything's been going good, you see. He's the great leader. He's already taken on the Mount Sinai. He's already seen the fire. He's already seen all the things happen. But now he's being overcome because rip rap and rabble rousers have stirred up the whole camp. And he's saying, God, get me out of this mess. Kill me if you have to. Just get me out of this mess. Then he said, the Bible tells us, the Lord said, I got something to tell you, Moses. You may think this is a simplistic answer to a monumental problem, but you'll find out that the solution is absolutely there. He said, Moses, I want you to find 70 men. I want you to find some men who believe with you. I want you to find some men who are on the same wavelength with you. I want you to find some men that know God. Every time I get to church, I find me some praying women in the church. You know what I mean? Some of those old saints of the Lord that have been there a long time. I had a ladies prayer group at uh, in Lakeland, Florida, and I had, them, uh, I had them positioned on the front row. When somebody went to the altar, they pounced on them like a cat on a June bug. They wouldn't let them up to victory time. We've lost the art 
of praying people through around our altars. You know what I mean? Everybody thinks they want to pass out and come back with a victory. There's some times passing out won't do you any good. You need to pray through. And you need somebody who knows God can stay there with you and ward off the devil and bring victory. And you need some praying people who will say, God, we won't move until revival comes. He said, you get them over there. There's a cloud that hangs over that place. You get that 70 people underneath that cloud and when you get underneath underneath the tabernacle, you just stand up down there, Moses. I'm getting ready to show them who's God in Israel. (laughs) I'm going to show Riff Rapt and Rabble Rouser something they ain't never seen before. I see them as they gather down underneath the old tabernacle and the core of the tabernacle. The fire of the Lord, no doubt, is overhead. And they come together And they might have said, well, Brother Moses, what is the purpose of this meeting? He said, wait just a minute. Hold on just a second. God said to bring you down here. And they're sitting there in anticipation. And all of a sudden, the waters are troubled. All of a sudden, there is something magnetic about the air. And he's been telling them they're going to the promised land. And they've been wondering, well, really, are we going to the promised land? But suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes down at that old tabernacle. And something begins to take place. That same thing that's on Moses jumps off of him. And jumps on 68 more of them, brother. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost fires moving around that place. And they're having a a, a revival at the tent of the tabernacle. God's Spirit's falling on them. Amen. Well, some, two of them didn't show that up, Eldad and Medad. And there's always some tattletale. Don't you ever think they won't tell the overseer what you said? So help me, Lord, they'll tell him everything. Brother, I want to tell you this. They'll tell everything you ever say. You better believe they will. I know they'll tell it. We're the biggest tattletales in the world. Somebody said, El Dad and me, Dad missed the meeting and they didn't show up. And they're over there in the city prophesying and shouting just like everybody else. Joshua said, we've got to do something about that. Moses said, look, you leave them alone. I would that all of God's people would prophesy. I would that everybody had the Holy Ghost. I would that everybody had a touch of God. That's what we've got to have today. We've got to quit putting bounds upon bind, binding God. We've got to quit putting boundaries upon what God can do and say, Lord, sweep over us. Touch us any way you want to. Just raise up men and women who are dedicated to seeing revival. Raise up people who get underneath the tent of the tabernacle. Raise up some people who get underneath Underneath the flow of God's power and let the glory of the Lord flow upon them. You may think it's simplistic, but it is the absolute truth. If the leadership of the church of God will get its people together and say, God, fall on us again and jump off of us and jump on somebody else and you get this one and you get that one, why, right here in this place tonight, The same spirit jump on Brother Pemberton. Jump over there and grab a hold of somebody else. And somebody say, well, I don't know what we're going to do. Somebody, oh yeah, I know what we're going to do. The spirit of prophecy falls on you. You say, we're going across and we're going to possess the land. We've got enough prophets of doom in this day and time. We've got people that's been prophesying the death of the church of God. Some of them have even written the obituary for some of our churches. That's the place I like to go where somebody's written it off. Where somebody stole the money. Where somebody's run off with somebody else's wife and they're making havoc of God's work and just stand there because when you stand there there's not a devil in hell can make you move because you're on divine assignment you're God's chosen person and when that spirit comes on you he'll raise up somebody else and they'll say oh yes we can preacher we can make it blessed be God we serve a powerful God tonight he's still in charge of the church it's still Jesus' church he still purchased it with his own blood he won't forsake us in this last day he wants to touch us with unity he wants to touch us with power. He wants to give us a clear purpose for our existence. He wants us to possess the land. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God, give us unity. Give us unity. Touch us with your spirit. Don't let us be the same. Oh, Holy Ghost, drive out the chaff. The Lord is in this house. The 
Lord wants you to bury some things. The Lord wants you to get some things out of your life. He wants you to get on the same page with your brother. And look up, brother, because we're going to take this land. Revival is going to sweep the land. You need to get on board now. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord and praise His name. Where my spirit is, there is unity. I want you to come together as my children, for I have a purpose for you. I have a work for you to do. Come together in my spirit, and I shall show you great and mighty things, for I am in the midst of you. I am giving you the call. Come forward and do my ministry, saith the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, there's something happening in this prayer conference. It's not a regular ordinary meeting and I'm not a regular ordinary preacher and you're not a regular ordinary person. We are here on divine assignment. God wants to shake this church from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to the Tennessee border. He wants it to break out in every mountain hamlet. He wants it to break out in every little, little, little village across this state. He wants to send revival. I sense it in my soul. He doesn't want us to do business as ordinary. He wants to do something spectacular. That's what he's doing tonight. Well, praise his name. You know what? I look at churches that are growing. And I ask the pastors, why is your church growing? And some of the fastest growing churches that I see, they just say to me, uh, you know, Dennis, I don't really know why I'm growing. I don't know. Is it the program that's growing? Uh, is it this that's growing? Is it that growing? No, that's not the reason. And I've heard this over and over. And they say, I guess we're just having church. Have you ever heard that? Dear Lord, I feel like having church. You know, as a pastor, Brother Steve, sometimes the devil beat me up one side and down the other all week long. He'd get the people sideways to each other, and everybody in the church that dated somebody end up married in the church, and then they'd split up, and two or three families would spit on each other half the time. You know, you know that stuff. Everything goes through, and everything that happens, the price of egg goes up in China and affects your church. You know what I'm saying? And they sit there, and, but I'd say, you low down, dirty devil, you, you wait till I get you there to church Sunday morning. And if you think you've seen something, you wait till Sunday night. If I have to give 25 altar calls, I won't let that church go home until I break through. And you say, that's simplistic. Well, I don't know any other way to preach it. When you get the fire of the Holy Ghost coming down, you have a mighty move of God in your church. You don't have to sit there and depend upon your own intellect. And you don't have to depend upon your own ingenuity. But when the Spirit of the Lord comes down, it's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my Spirit. I'd see him Sunday night after Sunday night fuse that church together. Things that could become a problem to me suddenly would disappear because the Lord would come down on me and he'd follow my church and we'd leave there and say it was good to be in the house of the Lord and people who were against each other would love each other because they'd been in the presence of the Lord. Church of God people like to have church. They don't want to go to a silly performance and they don't want to hear somebody give something dry, hide as dry as a Texas wind. They want to go to church. You don't have to be some orator to preach. All you have to be is an instrument that can reach up to Heavenly Father and let the Holy Ghost, I mean the genuine Holy Ghost, not something that you move, you work up, not something you tell somebody to say, and not some little gimmick you go through, or something you see saw somebody else do, but something God put on your heart when you prayed and fasted and laid before Him. He'll unify your church. He'll touch you with fire. Hallelujah.
You know what I believe happened down there? I believe they got to praising the Lord. I believe Moses said, we're going to go to the promised land. By the time he prophesied that, 70 more men said, we're going to the promised land. Won't you say that with me? We're going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land. My Lord, have mercy. If a preacher got up and started preaching that Sunday morning, he said, we're going to win this town. They said, we're going to win the town. It'd shake up every old riff wrapped in rabble rouser. You know what he'd do? He'd take, now this goes way back, but he'd take the tuck head. He'd go back in his shell and he'd hide for a day when you wouldn't prayed up and hadn't, didn't have a hold of God. And then he'd show up again. Don't think you're going to ever get rid of him. No, no, no. You just got to have the move of God in your soul and the anointing in your life so that you don't have to stand up there and call him by name. You can't attack him. All you have to do is say, Lord, what's on me? Let it fall on them. Amen. And it'll look, it'll look, it'll look, it'll look. We make our mistake, won't have a meeting. Every time you have a meeting, they're winners and losers. Yeah, you may win every meeting, but you keep losing. Somebody every time, they lose. That's right. That's not the solution. The solution is not to get up there and work you out a little sermon where you can clean his plow and everybody in the church knows you're laying it on him. No, 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 no. That's not solution. He'll get your hide. That's what he'll do to you. Because he's got influence. He'll turn the tables and you might as well get you a U-Haul truck and get you a good place to go because riff wrapped and rabble rouser are going to nail your hide. But you get somewhere in the closet. You walk up to that pulpit and you say, Good evening, everyone. Hallelujah. Under your breath, you say, You sorry, low down devil. I know exactly where you're sitting. And I'm going to steamroll right over you and I'm going to shout my way out of this thing. Amen? What do you mean? He said, Jehoshaphat, he said, our eyes are on you, Lord. We're just going to sing and praise the Lord if something takes place. And he ran over it. We've forgotten about praise in the house of the Lord. When we get so beat down and we get so oppressed and, and riffraff and rabble rousers destroy us, we don't have any praise about us. Confuse the devil. Throw your head back and joy in the God of your salvation. Rejoice evermore. Don't even let the devil know he's after you. Praise God. Just rise above him and say, God, let what's on me fall on them. tell you right now the way I'm feeling now nothing will be open but Ruby Tuesdays tonight glory to God <laughs> Woo! well you see riff wrapped and rabble rousers threw them in jail and you know it would be a good time to resign and say why me Lord what have I ever done to deserve this don't sing that song around me glory to God hallelujah I got the victory today yeah I can see them sitting there, you know, say, well, you know, they think we ought to be upset and crying in here. They've even got a jailer spend the night down here to keep us in this place. Well, what are we going to do? Well, I tell you what I feel like doing. I feel like it's midnight, you know. We want to start the day off right. Let's start off with a prayer meeting. Hallelujah. And they start singing praises unto God and glorifying God. If we get our chin up and not let the devil know he's affecting us, and sing the song of Zion in the face of your enemy, somebody, it, it's going to strike a chord and somebody's soul in that church, they're going to get on board with you and suddenly there'll be a move of God across that place. And they sang, it was midnight, but thanks be unto God, heaven tuned into them. They didn't have a key to the locks and they couldn't get out the door, but the one they were singing to, praise God, he put it all together to begin with. He sent a very precise earthquake to that jailhouse and he shook it up, praise the Lord. And they walked out of that place and the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? You don't have to capitulate to the devil. The victory's yours. You just stand your ground. Get in his presence. Bring the presence of the Lord down among your people. Stay before God until you've been with the Lord like Moses was at Sinai. Until they know that you've been with Jesus. Until they know that you've got a hold of God. And Riff Raff will be afraid of you. Rebel Rouser will be afraid of you. They say you better not touch that man. He's been with God. And the Holy Ghost will anoint you. And the fire will fall. And revival will come. Oh, Holy Ghost. 
let it happen. Hallelujah. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. It's good enough for me. Well, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It's been tried in the fiery furnace. It's been tried in the fiery furnace. It's been tried in the fiery furnace. It's good enough for me. It will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It's good enough for me. Well, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. You say you make it so simple. If that's too simplistic, Brother McGuire, I'm just telling you what happened in the Bible. What's going to happen to Riff, Rapt, and Rabble Rousers? They're going to get what they asked for. God said they won't fish. They won't flesh. I'm going to give it to them. Not one day, not two days. Not three days. I'm going to give it to them a solid month. Tell me God ain't got a sense of humor. He said I'm going to give it to them till it runs out their nose. <laughs> Makes every one of them sick. Trace the path of riff wrapped in rabble out Eventually, they get what they're looking for, don't they? <laughs> and they think, they have the audacity to think that they're going to sidetrack some church of God preacher and his wife and intimidate them and harass them until they have to hide somewhere in a hole and say, they got the best of me. Kill me, God. What have I done wrong? Come out. Stand flat-footed. If there's anything to it that you be God in Israel day you speak the God of fire let him answer I'm not going to fuss with them I'm not even going to argue with them I'm not even going to call their name and I'm not even going to work up a committee to go get them I'm going to say in the name of the Lord God Jehovah burn in this place You know how it starts? It'll never start in your church. It starts in the state, just like this, see? We need to get all on the same level in the state. I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying we need to be that way. The church of God needs to be that way. Enough of our cynicism. Enough of our criticism. We've got enough to go around. Dear Lord, you look at me and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. If you don't believe me, ask some of my close friends, like DeRosa, somebody like that, you know. You, you, can, you can find a lot of things for anybody, but that's not the important thing. It's something that God has done for all of us. He's put a fire inside of us. And that fire is contagious. It just can't be taught as easy as it can be caught. And what we need tonight is something that can be caught. <laughs> something that can be caught. And while you're standing there, somebody catches a holy fever. And you say, we're going across. And from the back of the church, you hear the lady say, yeah, that's right, preacher, we're going across. And over here, you'll hear a man that hadn't said anything for you. Yes, sir, we're going across. And another said, we're going across. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is coming. Unity's coming. Fire's coming. It won't be your job then. You see what he said? I'm going to come on them so that you won't have to do it all by yourself. That's when we're going to do the work. When it gets off of us and on our lay people, they go to the prison and they go to the jails and they go to other places because they caught it. They caught it and they 
God will raise up deliverance. There will be people come to your church you never dreamed would come. If you, I've got to quit preaching, but I've got to tell you this. Don't spend all of your time on riff wrapped in ramble rousers. And don't let them discourage you. And don't go park at their house and let them tell you how sorry low down you are. You go in their living room, say, raise your hands, pray for them, hit out the front door and talk to somebody that's got the victory. Don't miss them. Talk to somebody that's got the same victory. Uh, would you just reach over and lay your hand on somebody beside you? I feel like the Lord just wants to move across this place right now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Come down in this place right now, Holy Ghost. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Hallelujah. 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 I want to ask you to do something while you're praising the Lord. Would you just start walking toward this altar, everybody in this house that can? Would you just start walking this way? Just move as close as you can, Brother Pemberton, Brother Messy. Come here, Brother Childers. Come on up here with me. Praise God. Feel the army moving. Come on. That's right.